Hi folks, uh, I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Stephen Dake from Cisco Systems. I'm here to present about COLA. Uh, and this is Sam Yaple. Sam, would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, I'm Sam Yaple. And you work where? <laughs> I work at, at a company called Servosity. It's a backup company. And your interests are what? Uh, I like, uh, well, I like uh, storage, obviously, because I work at a backup company. But uh, here with Cola, I, uh, I highly enjoy um, automating deployment. And OpenStack is kind of a complicated thing to deploy. Cool. So Sam's a core reviewer on Cola. We have nine core reviewers, and Sam is one of them. Uh, he's uh, been pretty instrumental in helping with the Ansible aspect of things. So. I thought it'd be good for us to both present COLA uh, with our new Ansible deployment system. So first of all, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Sam, why don't you go ahead and kick off the demo? OK. Um, the, uh, the first thing that we're going to do here uh, is um, uh, go ahead and I'm just going to dive right in and show you uh, how we configure and deploy COLA. While that's going, we can talk a little bit more about the, uh, the uh, architecture and uh, uh, other things about COLA. I don't know how to switch out to SSH window. It's a live demo, by the way. Live demo. So yeah. that'll be fun. There we go. Escape. OK. I can and figure it out. I don't know how to use a Mac. Oh, you don't know how to use a Mac? <laughs> OK. It's like so easy, kind of. You should have told me that ahead of time. I, I did. It's cool. Did Not you? a big deal. OK, I must have missed that. I think we'll get it. There you go. All right. Uh, Yes. OK. All right. So uh, I, I just want to show uh, right now what we're going to deploy. We're going to be deploying on uh, three nodes um, and uh, Mac keyboards. Um, these are the three nodes. I just want to show you that there is no container running on them. Um, uh, so we'll be, uh, we'll be doing all this uh, fresh. Uh, I believe our wireless may have dropped out. There we go. No, you're good. Uh, all right, so I have uh, Cola already uh, cloned uh, from the Git repo. Um, the, the first step is to uh, move what we have in our Etsy directory here uh, into uh, your Etsy directory on the deploy host. Um, so I'm just going to copy that in now. Uh, and it copies in uh, quite a few files here, and we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, uh, but the, uh, the main file that you would be doing most of your configuration is uh, globals.yaml, uh, and that's where we have uh, most all the options you need to configure. Um, out of the box, Cola needs very few options. I believe in this case only five options to uh, deploy working OpenStack across the board. Um, and I'll go through what these options are. Um, the first one is it needs a, a base distro type. Um, we build against CentOS, Ubuntu, uh, and then we build uh, two different types, a binary and source uh, in our gate. Uh, so those are the ones that are actively uh, tested and gated against. Uh, here we're going to be deploying CentOS, uh, and we're going to be deploying OpenStack uh, with binary packages in those containers. Uh, we could also build from uh, source if we choose. Um, so that way you could uh, have your own fork of Nova or Neutron or wherever and point it to that, uh, that Git repository, and it'll build a container based on that. Um, this option here, Cola internal address, this is a, a VIP that's used for uh, Keep Alive in our case. Uh, just a standard virtual IP address. This is what we use to talk to all of our um, API services with. And the VIP that we're going to put on there is 148. This just needs to be a non-used IP in your network. Because uh, we'll go ahead and set up a keep alive D and HA proxy by default. Um, should you want to, you could turn those services off and use a, a load balancer. Uh, and then you'd be able to handle all that yourself. You'd still put in the VIP that you plan on using there. Uh, for the external address, um, we're going to put in the external address for this box that can be reached at. Um, it's called uh, broked.net. Hoping that's not accurate. <laughs> I didn't name it. Probably accurate. No, no. Uh, so we're, we're going to put in the external address there. And that's right now that's really only going to be used um, in, uh, in Keystone. It'll show up as your uh, external endpoint. Um, so you can connect to these services uh, over the internet. Uh, and that's really the, the primary place that's used. Um, this Docker registry option, uh, you can push images to uh, the Docker Hub. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Docker, that's uh, just a central repository of images uh, that can be reached and pulled from, from just about anywhere. Uh, in our case, we have a, a local repository. 
Um, and I'm just going to put in the information to connect to that local repository, uh, which is you at this address. There, What's that? You have commas. Yeah. That would have worked. It wouldn't Probably have. Not. Don't don't do that. Uh, so th this is the uh, the address in our internal network where a uh, Docker registry is running. Uh, in our case, we only need to set that, but uh, should you, if you had authentication or uh, anything on your network, you can uh, optionally set these uh, parameters. But in our case, we only need to set the Docker registry. Um, there are other options in here. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, uh, these are pretty well documented, and there's uh, more advanced options throughout. Um, uh, but we have these... Uh, uh, in our documentation throughout. So I'm only going to be discussing the, the main ones of uh, interest and the ones we're going to be using in deployment uh, right now. Well, since it doesn't want to move, okay, no, there we go. There. Just have to be patient. Just be patient, yeah. You guys see the lights up here? No. It's a little nerve wracking. All right. So the, the network interface here. Um, and the, this is going to be the network interface. Uh, it should have an IP address on it. This is what all your, uh, your services will bind to by default. Uh, so all your API services, um, storage network traffic, uh, tenant network VXLAN stuff, that, that'll all bind to this network by default. Uh, so you want to put an interface in there that has an IP address on that, uh, that, that can be contacted. Uh, in our case, we, we have IP addresses on that interface. Um, you can be more specific uh, and specify API interface or storage and tunnel interface to to make sure that uh, those particular traffics go over the interfaces and therefore the networks that you want them to go over. Um, one of the final, if not the final things that we're going to be using here uh, is the external interface. This is uh, one that you would typically give to uh, Neutron for o Open vSwitch or Linux Bridge. Um, this one shouldn't have an IP address because in most configurations that IP address is, is no longer usable. Uh, so that's why it's recommended to not have an IP address on this interface. It's uh, mainly used for just uh, L2 traffic. Um, to d switch between Open vSwitch and Linux Bridge, which there are different ways to, to set those up, it's, it's real simple here. Uh, you would just change an option. Uh, and that's how most of the configuration for OpenStack is done throughout. It's just changing a, a small option here in this globals.yaml, uh, and you change what you deploy. Um, the tag that we're going to be using uh, is... Is that, uh, are we using the latest tag? Yes. Okay. So we're gonna, uh, we've tagged our images and we built them ahead of time. Uh, and we used it with the uh, latest tag. I think we actually have a different tag, but it'll break pretty quickly if we have a different tag. The first thing it does is try to pull an image. Uh, so we'll change that if, uh, if that's the case. Uh, we're going to enable two services. Um, we uh, support uh, deploying Ceph automatically uh, with these playbooks. Uh, so we're going to enable Ceph as well. And this will configure OpenStack to use Ceph as well. Um, this is great for, for testing because Ceph can be uh, a, a pain to set up as well sometimes too. So setting it up automatically is a, it's a pretty nice way for us to exercise all the Ceph code that we have. Um, with those enabled, uh, I'm going to close out the file. That was it. Uh, in total, that was what? One, two, three, four, five. That was eight options in total. Seven. I think it's eight with the sender and oh, Ceph yeah, enabled. Yeah, right. So that's eight options, and that's enough to get you rolling with, uh, with OpenStack and, and Cola. Um, because we are using Ceph, uh, I did mention that we can uh, deploy that automatically. One thing that we do have to do is set a special flag on the disk itself. Um, we're going to show you just that the, it doesn't have a flag right now. Uh, so there's no, there's no partitions on this disk. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put a special flag uh, on there. I may even have it in my history. Yeah, so I'm going to set this, uh, this Cola Ceph OSD bootstrap flag. This is just going to a way for Ansible and the Ansible scripts to know that it's okay to use this disk. Uh, so it's uh, non-destructive other than that. So it has an explicit action on your part for it to try to use that disk. And you see it's set. Um, so after that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a deploy. Uh, we're going to run time on it uh, as well, so you'll see how long it actually takes. Set the, uh, oh, the inventory file. Let me explain that real quick. The inventory, ah, it looks like I've already said it. Uh, the inventory file is pretty simple. This is what, uh, this is what controls which hosts run on which. Uh, it's a standard uh, Ansible inventory, so there's lots of documentation from Ansible on this. Um, in this case, we have three servers called Minimi 01, 2, and 3. Um, and, and I've set these here so that it knows that uh, to deploy services uh, on these hosts. 
Um, the file can be, uh, you can be as explicit as you possibly want, so you can scale out just Nova API or, or scale out just RabbitMQ. Um, and that's documented in how to do that in the file. Uh, and here we're just using the, the basic setup. Since we only have three nodes, we're going to be deploying all the services on all three of the nodes for, for high availability. Um, but that's just the, the structure of this file. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run the deploy now. And like I said, I think we may have named the tag something different, so we'll see. Um, it's going to uh, start running. You see the Ansible command. It's, uh, it's run up there. It's going to start going through and, and uh, copying over configuration files uh, and, and finally uh, starting containers for each individual service. Um, the, the first action for starting the container should be coming up here pretty quickly. And if that times out, then I know I have the wrong flag. Um, oh, look at that. It's, uh, it started the container, so... Okay. My turn. <laughs> Sam had the hard part. So I'll go back into our slides. <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to let that uh, kick off. And uh, it takes about 18 minutes to deploy. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to stand here and uh, look at uh, Ansible scroll for 18 minutes. That's a, kind of a big waste of time. Um, so instead, um, I'd like to kind of explain the environment a little bit and talk about uh, what we've got, uh, how the system uh, is operational, uh, since I can figure out how to operate PowerPoint. <laughs> OK, there we go. So uh, this is my home lab configuration. Uh, there's two networks. Uh, one is a management network. Uh, you see that's a 192.168.1.1 network. Uh, the other network is the 10.0.2.0 network. That's a neutron public network. That goes to a public router, uh, which goes out over my cable modem, which is in the upper left-hand corner. It's broke.selfip.net. The cable modem uh, uses DynDNS, so it registers its IP address with the global DNS system. So I can connect to broke.selfip.net and be able to access my machine, my, my OpenStack cluster from remote. Now, if you were running a real operation, you wouldn't probably have this kind of setup. This is how I set up my lab you might have a different different kind of configuration. Uh, the other uh, key point here is uh, we have a round robin IP address of .148. Uh, that's a virtual IP address, which is just an IP that is unassigned. Uh, we use HA proxy on that address to uh, load balance to all of the NWAY active HA services that we run. So we run all of OpenStack and NWAY active HA. And by doing that, uh, we get really good high availability. The only thing we don't run in, in NWAY Active is the database, because the data, database locks up. I'm sure many people are aware of that. Um, so that's uh, my home lab configuration. Uh, here's the NAT setup that uh, I've got in my environment. Uh, the NAT setup, uh, basically what happens is uh, we're going to access my cloud from Japan here over our wireless, wonderful wireless at this conference. Uh, and we're going to access my cloud at home. The way for that to happen is through NAT. Um, so on my wireless router, I've got NAT set up. Uh, the key thing to point out here, just let me step off the stage. Uh, the key thing to point out here is uh, this device IP is 192.168.1.148. These, the, these are all of the different services. We've got Horizon, Keystone, Glance, Nova, uh, Neutron, Sender, Heat. Uh, and Keystone Admin. So uh, you can set this up any way you like. I would expect that a proper deployment would probably use NAT as well, uh, maybe with real gear, not a um, WRT1900. <laughs> so this is kind of a guess. I don't know specifically, uh, but that would be my expectation. Um, I'd like to talk. So that's, the, that's how the demo is set up. Um, very straightforward. Uh, once the, the demo takes again about 18 minutes, once we get done, Sam will show you some of the activities of using the deployed cloud and now it's actually operational in our 50 or 60 containers that uh, constitute COLA. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about the community. So one of the cool things about COLA is uh, we have a, the team diversity flag. So I don't know how many people in this room are familiar with the governance repo, but essentially when, when OpenStack went through the big tent, they kind of added this thing called tags. So a tag could be assigned to a project, so operators could determine if the project was suitable for them. One of these tags is the Team Diverse Affiliation tag, or something like that, I don't quite recall. And this tag, what it represents is it means a lot of different companies and people are contributing to the code. 
So if one individual company were to drop out of contribution from the project, the, the project would still survive and be pretty healthy. Um, COLA has a really nice diverse affiliation. You can see that from our diagrams of our reviews and our commits. Uh, you see a lot of different uh, kind of big names in computing there. And it's pretty even. Uh, the pie chart's pretty even. I'd like, I'd like the pie chart to be even more even. I'd like 10% from 10 contributors versus like 21% uh, from Red Hat and 20% from Cisco. Um, I'd like that to be 10% for from like each company. But still, we are one of the most diverse projects inside of OpenStack, probably the most diverse is Neutron. Uh, but we're very diverse and we're a brand new project. So it's very rare for a new project to have this diverse affiliation tag. Uh, if, I, if I were an operator and I were judging whether or not to use a project in my deployment, this would be the first thing I would judge is a diverse affiliation. Uh, if the project was diversely affiliated, uh, because that means the project will last a long time. I'd also evaluate whether it met my technical needs, but assuming it does, uh, I would look at that diverse affiliation. So what is COLA? Uh, COLA is a deployment system. It deploys Docker containers. The Docker containers contain OpenStack services and OpenStack infrastructure services like MariaDB. Um, and when it deploys them, it uses Ansible to deploy them. Our Ansible code base is about 8,500 lines. Our Docker code base is about 3,000 lines, in all, including the documentation. COLA is about 15,000 lines of code. So it's very small, very tidy, uh, but it's very expressive. Uh, we can do quite a bit of work with it. You can see, I'm not going to read off the whole uh, feature set there. Um, I think the key things that I like about COLA is that we have good, real, real, real positive in-way uh, HA. Uh, it works really well. It's very, fan very fantastically designed. Also, we support Ceph, implement Ceph. The Ceph implementation is pretty new. It's probably about two weeks old. But uh, I think if you're deploying OpenStack, you really have to look at Ceph as an option. Uh, and if you're not looking at Ceph as an option, you're increasing your pain threshold mm -hmm. quite a bit. Or you have to have a nice pain threshold to not have Ceph. So Ceph solves a lot of real problems with OpenStack. It solves HA problems of your storage. It, uh, it solves uh, not having to store everything a bunch of across a different, bunch of different nodes. It solves not having to back up from different machines. Everything's centralized. So Ceph is really nice. And uh, I think we're the only deployment tool that deploys Ceph. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I'll, I'll go with that. Um, we have really good distro choice. So we support Ubuntu and CentOS and RHEL and Oracle Linux. And in fact, Oracle uh, is just released a product based upon COLA. And uh, so I get asked this question a lot. Uh, is COLA, does COLA have any real production deployments? And the answer is no, because we're pretty much brand new mm -hmm. in terms of our implementation. But I expect through Oracle's uh, productization of COLA, there will be a, a, a quite a bit of new deployments. And uh, I would like to see COLA targeted at the 100 node deploy environment, maybe like three racks, something like that uh, with networking. Maybe there would be a three rack deployment. I think this is pretty common size for deployments, uh, maybe at the large end. Um, so I'd like to see that. That's where I'd like to see our target hit. Uh, and in terms of kind of other features we have, we're, we're, we're very anti-dependency, as all good software developers should be, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you should have good dependency management in your software. Uh, and we only depend on Docker PY and the Docker engine uh, or whatever distro packages in Docker for the deploy target nodes. So we, we don't have to load a bunch of software on there to get, to get things to work. And this works really well for, for distros like Atomic or distros that have a read-only USR file system uh, because you, you don't have to get them to d distribute a bunch of dependencies. Instead, you just get them to distribute Docker PY and Docker Engine. Uh, and everybody's doing that already. Uh, if you're delivering OpenStack, sorry, if you're delivering a container operating system, which is like, uh, uh, which would be uh, these types of operating systems with the read-only USR file system, um, you're, you're going to have Docker, Docker PY on the, on the system. So um, I think everybody's had a chance to read through the slide, uh, so I'll, I'll move on. I just want to point out that, that in closing here that we really deploy a lot of the services. A lot of the major services of OpenStack are deployed today. They're functional today. They work well today. We deliver OpenStack as it was probably a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, uh, completely. 
uh, where we're going in the future. We're, we're going to deliver the big tent entirely. Uh, and the big tent is going to, um, we've got about 15 services to, to package. It takes us about 15, 20 hours to do a, a service. Sounds about right. Okay. Uh, I, do want, I do want to interrupt you real oh quick. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to point out, uh, you know, li live demos and what they are. I did actually have the wrong tag before. So I, I went back and I changed that tag and continued to deploy. Uh, the time's not going to be accurate because of that. Um, it, uh, it stopped after the, the Ceph deploy. Uh, so I did change that tag and uh, started it up again. Um, uh, so, I mean, we can continue from there. Okay, good. So we're solid now? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. the point. I'll move on with the presentation. Though. Live demos for the win. Okay, so COLA principles. Uh, so I, I just talked a whole bunch about community, but our project is designed by the community. It's not like uh, some rocket science somewhere said, okay, we're going to go design COLA. You know, we, we've, we've gone through every kind of permutation you could think of with Docker. Uh, we've used Kubernetes. Uh, we've tried a bunch of different ideas, and we've really settled on a very nice, simple implementation. Uh, and it's all been designed by people that have a common interest in working on container technology, working on deployment, because in my mind, deployment is the biggest problem OpenStack faces today. Uh, and everybody that's part of the core team, I think they have that common philosophy. So we have a very common community there. Um, it's not just the, our nine guys on our core team that write the code, though. We also have about 30 other people that contribute code over time, uh, maybe like five or six commits a, re a release. That's, that's not a lot of commits, but it's, it's a contribution. And uh, I, I consider it very highly uh, that people would take the time out of their day to contribute to COLA. So COLA is designed and implemented by the community. Um, that's one of our key principles. If we didn't have community, what would be the point? We might as well just be a proprietary software product. And we might as well just uh, jam our stuff in a private repository, not even use GitHub, uh, you know, just have our little private repos. We don't do that. We're very open, very community-oriented. If things don't happen in the open, I get very upset. Um, you know, if the PTL change, I'm the PTL call. If the PTL were to change the call, that might change. But for now, we're very oriented towards community. Um, so we're designed for scale. Let me explain what I mean by that. I don't mean scale of the deployment. I mean scale of the project. So we're designed to scale the development effort very quickly because we expect over time OpenStack will grow much faster than it's growing today. So we're desi we've designed our project in ways that may not be optimal technically, but they're optimal in terms of adding new contributors. Things are very simple. Things are very straightforward, very simple to understand. I'll get more into that later in a later slide. Uh, but we're designed for scale in terms of our developer community, in terms of people joining the project and learning about the project. That's how we're designed. We haven't totally delivered on that thing, on that area in places like documentation. Uh, but uh, we had a great session uh, at Summit about that, and we're going to improve our documentation. So right now, I, we hear complaints that we have too much documentation. <laughs> Uh, so I have ne never heard that before, but that. Um, okay, so we're designed for choice. I talked about our distro choices. We have good distro choices. We also don't force people into packaging or source only. Uh, we let you choose what you want. Now, sometimes you can't have everything. So, for example, on RDO, there is no Murano packaging. So if you want Murano, you have to deploy from source, or you have to deploy everything from RDO and deploy Murano from source uh, separately and uh, build it s separately. So. We can support that model. We can support just changes of Ubuntu versus CentOS on the same environment with RDO and source. All that stuff would work. Uh, I wouldn't do it personally. I think you should stick with one choice. You make, make a choice for a reason. It's a good choice. You stick with it. But if you wanted to you know, mix things up, you could. Uh, so we're designed for choice. Um, now, our project is executed exception free. Now, I'm not talking about like Python exceptions or anything like that. What I'm talking about is uh, people, uh, some people in life make choices and they, they make exceptions. They say, well, I'm only going to do this this one time. And let me give you an example. Uh, early on in our community, we kind of were at this point where we were developing our software and you know, we didn't have enough reviewers, core reviewers to review this stuff. I said, no, we're not going to drop down to one reviewer. We're not going to let one reviewer because that would be an exception. Uh, so instead we say, okay, every patch has to go through two reviews. Uh, every code has to be community driven. 
those, this is what I mean by exceptions. We don't, we don't cut corners on those, on those things because if you make one exception, then it's easy to make another exception, and then it's easy to make another exception, and that could harm the health of the project. That could harm the health of an organization. I think except, exceptions are the way to the dark side, personally. Uh, so this is something I've really driven into the project uh, with my involvement. So those are our principles. Uh, we have more probably. Uh, Sam could tell you all day long about DRY, but I won't get into that. Um, uh, I'll talk about our technology a bit. I'm going to tell you about the two things you have to learn to develop for COLA. So this is the first thing. This is a uh, Jinja 2 template. The Jinja 2 template, uh, basically, um, the only thing we use from Jinja 2 are the conditionals. So this is a Docker file. Uh, the Docker file, Docker file people that are Docker Inc. didn't add conditionals to to Docker files because it complicates Docker. It would make Docker much more hard, much more difficult to implement. But if you implement it outside of Docker, then it makes it pretty easy to implement using Jinja 2, and that's how we implement our conditionals. This is how we get all of our distros, uh, such as Ubuntu and, and RHEL, into the same file because we want to be able to look at uh, something like heat, which is what this is an example of, all in the same place. Uh, we, you know, if we want heat, if we have a heat-based file, we want heat to, we want to look at heat in one location, not over five different files. Uh, this is a evolution. Before we had a bunch of sim links and a bunch of separate Docker files for each different distribution. We had like a thousand sim links or something. It was crazy. It didn't make any sense. So uh, this is uh, this is not necessarily a best practice, but this is something we do and. Uh, I think it's uh, really beneficial uh, for Docker. If you use Docker and you want to support your software across different um, system call interfaces for Ubuntu and RHEL, for example, this is what you have to do. And this is a solution you have to choose. Now, this is what we use. This is one of the two technologies that you have to learn to develop for COLA. The other technology is our Ansible orchestration methodology. And here it is. Uh, you see there's three sim simple steps there. Uh, essentially, I'll talk through them uh, briefly. What we have to do is we take a configuration that is our custom configuration, and we take the default configuration, we merge them together. We start the container the first time. Let's say we're starting a service like Lance. We start the Lance container the first time. We bootstrap it. Uh, by bootstrapping it, we initialize the database. Uh, we initialize the database users. Once the container is bootstrapped, we wait for it to exit, and then we start Glance. Now, bootstrapping doesn't happen all, all the time. It only happens one time at the first boot of the, the deployment. So we don't expect boot, bootstrapping to happen very often. We expect that to be a very rare occurrence. Um, now, why do we have this method? Why do we have this process? Because it's simple. It's straightforward. It's repeatable. It's a pattern, and we want to use this pattern over and over and over. Now, there are some things that don't use this pattern. Probably Ceph doesn't. I'm not quite sure uh, on Ceph. But there may, be, there may be some exceptions, not exceptions, but differences into the, because we can't use this pattern on Ceph, for example. Um, so we do something a little different. But we still try to follow the same model uh, throughout the code base. So if you learn this, you can, you can add a big tent service. Uh, our goal is for people to have Typically, people have four-hour blocks of a day, maybe two in a day if they're lucky to work. Our goal is for people to be able to learn to contribute to COLA in three four-hour blocks, so 12 hours of work, uh, knowing nothing about Docker, knowing nothing about Ansible. And I believe we c we've met that. Uh, so if you want to contribute to COLA, great place to contribute. It's easy. Uh, and there's, we've got a ton of work to do. We've got so much work, it's not even funny. Uh, but today, COLA is deployable and usable in the field. Uh, I'm really excited to see what happens from Oracle's cells uh, and what they do uh, in the field and what they produce bug-wise for us to fix uh, because I don't think there's a lot of bugs because we have a very small code base. And because our code base is small, uh, there's less bugs. There probably are some bugs. Uh, you know, I don't make bug-free software. Uh, okay, validation. So uh, <coughs> we use standard gating. We gate our builds. So every container is gated on its build. If we build, if we have a container, we have about 95 containers or something like that. We gate those containers on the build, so before a commit can go into the repo, it has to be built. Um, now we have we have an override file where we say, okay, these containers we know they don't build for this distro or whatever, uh, and we can just turn those off. So we don't always gate consistently, but we have control over when we choose not to gate. Um, so we have that. We 
deploy a subset of containers. So we have those 95 containers, but we don't have Ansible code for all of them. We have Ansible code for maybe like 80% of them. So we do the, uh, we deploy with Ansible for those 80% of our services we have. And we only build those containers we need. Uh, we have some technology called profiling, which allows us to profile and build a profile of things that uh, are, would be like Compute Kit, for example, if you wanted that instead of a full uh, big tent deployment. Um, so that's, that's kind of our validation. Um, what we want to do next, something Paul Bork is working on, is Tempest validation uh, in the gate. So we actually validate the implementation running inside the gate. After that, we want to go from one node to two nodes and then advance on to maybe five node deployment uh, with three node HA and two compute nodes, and maybe storage nodes or something. So we want, to, it, we want to use OpenStack infrastructure and OpenStack gating to make sure that our software uh, comes out working well because it's really hard once you make a change to refactor it in a way uh, that is suitable to everybody because the change went in the first time because it was good. And uh, to get it to go in the second time because you need a bug fix is harder. So we like our code to pass that validation before. Um, you know, gating, for those people that don't know about gating, gating is kind of a fundamental shift in how software should be developed. And OpenStack is really leading the charge there. And we're really engaged in the OpenStack infrastructure team to make our gating work well. Okay, Sam, demo. Okay. Is it, uh, done deploying? Uh, it's not, not quite done. No, okay. I, I had uh, fat fingered that um, that tag. Uh, oh, I can switch over onto your laptop. Yeah, let's do that. Um, yeah, right now it's uh, it's on about uh, Cinder. So we, what we, we have is a, a small script to uh, you know put up the Cirrus image, uh, create a small network. Um, since all those services are deployed, I'm going to go ahead and run that because uh, I don't want to run out of time in showing you that it's a, it's a functional OpenStack environment. But right now it is on, uh, you'll see it in a second here, but it's on... Uh, Cinder, it's about wrapped up with that. Um, so at this point, Glance, Nova, Keystone, Neutron, uh, Ceph, um, MariaDB, Rabbit, those have all been set up. They've all been clustered, and I'll, I'll run through. Uh, I'll run through what that looks like um, uh, as we're waiting for for Heat to install, so we can show you a, a Heat demo there. Um, so well, as I said, it's uh, it's on Cinder right about now. Um, I'm going to switch over to the view that I had of the three other nodes. Uh, so this is all three nodes. Uh, before I showed you there was no Docker uh, images uh, or containers running. Uh, now you'll see there's, there's quite a few of them. Uh, that formatting is less than ideal. Was it S, capital S? That's even worse. Pipe it through uh, WC-L. Uh, you just want to count the containers? That yeah, are count the containers. All right, let's do that. So wireless. It's always the wireless. It's always the wireless. It's been dropping out on me. There you go. <laughs> ah, I'll take care of that, Sam. Keep yeah. going. L live demos, you know. They're, they're what everyone should be doing. Um, so thir 36 uh, containers are running right now. Those each uh, are microservices. So they each have one process running in each. Um, uh, so Heat's deploying right now. I'm going to go ahead and, like I said, uh, run the script that we have. Um, what it's named. What did you name the script? Uh, it's in the, set, uh, it's in the uh, demo directory. Okay. On your laptop? Laptop, yeah. Oh, there it is. Uh, okay, so you see the script here. Uh, uh, it's got some comments in there, but it creates a glance image, uh, creates the neutron images, uh, Nova. Um, it, it's a fairly basic script that just uh, sets it up the way we want to set it up. Um, uh, so we're just going to run that now. Ah, we need to source credentials. How many, how many times does that happen to all of you? Go to type every time. Every time. Every time. All the every time. time. Uh, so it's uh, started uh, obviously running. These are valid API call returns. So that should be some indication that it's working. Um, uh, we're going to jump back over the deployment now uh, and see if that's wrapped up. Okay, so like I said, the time's uh, a little fudged. In this, uh, uh, in this in environment, it takes about 18 minutes. Um, so it stopped about halfway through because of the tag issue, so I corrected that. It took about 11 minutes to run. Uh, but in total, you should be expecting about 18 minutes. Um, it depends on your hardware, of course. My hardware, 
I can deploy all this in about eight minutes. Uh, it depends on the, the registry as well, because you're going to be pulling down these images. So over a local network is, is ideal for speed. If you're pulling them over the Docker Hub, it's going to depend on your bandwidth and, and other factors like that. Uh, but at this point, uh, all of the services should be up, and I'm going to go ahead and test a few of them. Uh. You've got two minutes now. Okay. So we already showed that uh, we were, were hitting the APIs and doing things. So you see the service lifts. Um, these, uh, these agents are up. On your, uh, you have a heat, uh, I'm not sure where on your laptop you have demo the, directory. Ah, the demo directory. So we're going to run this uh, launch script. This is uh, launching uh, instances with heat. So open RC again. So what's really cool about this is uh, we're using heat to launch uh, VMs, and heat uses Nova and Neutron and Glance and all of the other services that are part of OpenStack. So if this works and doesn't implode, then you know you have pretty good confidence that OpenStack works. Now, I think it would be interesting to see if you did this a million times, how many times it failed. Uh, for me, it's not really failed in the demo unless I did something wrong as part of my work. Now, you, we see it here, it's, uh, Nova has started up a bunch of VMs. Um, Sam, why don't you do the Nova list and pipe through uh, the WC-L yeah. so we can see the active uh, instances, see how many, there you go. So that's just going to search for uh, ones that have kicked in an active state. I don't believe uh, any have uh, uh, yet. Oh, we've got seven in active state already. Right. Uh, I believe this launches uh, 10, 32, maybe? 32, I think. 30, 32? Okay, I'm well, sure. it launches quite a few instances, um, and uh, we'll be checking in on those. Um, I believe we have uh, two minutes left here. Did... Um, Let's uh, do Horizon real quick, and if folks have questions, please queue up at the microphone, and we'll take a few questions while we still have time, uh, if there are questions. While Sam shows us Horizon, I'll answer questions, Sam. And okay. if the core team could come up real quick, I just want to introduce the core team uh, briefly, and uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hey, um, so my question is, you said that you support deploying from source. So how do you handle dependencies? I mean, all those OpenStack services sometimes depend on various Python libraries, which also have to, I would assume, be there in a container. Right. So do you handle that? Do I handle that? Uh, the way it works is through the requirements file. So the requirements file specifies the dependencies of the, of the service. And we just uh, install the requirements dependencies. So we, we, we rely on upstream OpenStack projects to maintain their list of dependencies and the versions they need. So that's how we handle that. For front packaging, like RDO, the distros handle uh, the versioning. OK. Uh, a second question, if I may. Broke that self -IP down um, or do you integrate with existing Kubernetes environments? Say, say I already have a Kubernetes cluster I would like to use to schedule your containers. Yeah, no, we don't. We don't integrate with Kubernetes. Uh, we tried Kubernetes. It doesn't work for us because there's no net host functionality. There's no PID host functionality, which is what we need to implement uh, deployment of OpenStack services. So the Kubernetes community has said they don't want those, function those features in Kubernetes because they're security risk. We deploy on bare metal, so it's not a security risk for us. But if you're deploying in Kubernetes in a shared environment, it could be a security risk. OK, thanks. No bueno. Uh, it's 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 spinning. It's loading. Uh, well, I think Did the Did you Wi -Fi find the right bouncing. address? I think that's right. It's still loading. Okay, uh, cool. Th we've got uh, we've got Martin, Ryan, Paul, and uh, Michael up here. We're uh, they're the other core members for us. And we have some more co core folks, but they're just not uh, here at the yeah. moment. So yeah, we I, have nine in total. I'm probably going to be adding more shortly. All right, you have a question? Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting project compared with uh, uh, OpenStack Ansible. Uh, my question is, okay, for the OpenStack Ansible, this uh, support by Rackspace, it means that it have uh, the real world example with the uh, really high, high load. So yeah, I want to compare to this. Anyone has using this with the yeah, really high throughput and really high load, uh, like uh, 10 or 100 server. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, we haven't deployed Open, uh, Cola at 100 nodes, so we don't know. Uh, I don't know if OSAT has either. I, I, I don't have that information. Um, I would expect Cola would deploy at 100 nodes really easily. I don't think there's going to be any problems. If there are, they'll be very easy to solve. Uh, but we haven't done it, so I can't say for sure that it would work. But I, I would think it would. Uh, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. Where we run into trouble with Cola 
is on the scalability is the database and RabbitMQ and do those scale, you know, and, and that, then you're talking thousands of nodes, not hundreds of nodes where the scale limits are. Okay, uh, and a quick question. Uh, your script is now support, uh, I mean, uh, scale the node, like uh, if you want uh, one more compute node, yeah. is that already included? Yeah, that yeah, works. Yeah, all you have to do is add it in that Ansible inventory file, just add another one uh, and run the, the playbooks again and it adds it no problem. And you can do it with all the services, including okay. the database and Rabbit. Oh, okay, let me try that. Thanks. I, sure. I think we're out of time now. Yeah, we're out of time, folks. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate your time. I hope you try out Cola. Uh, would, if, you, if you need help, come to the Pound Cola channel on Freenode. We'll help you out. We'll get you started. Uh, we'll help you evaluate Cola. I really want deployments of Cola. Uh, so if, if there's anything we can do to make that happen, let us know, and we'll be willing to help there. Thank you. I appreciate your time. <laughs>